clearly the work of an amateur on display. Well, I've always wanted to live stream. I wanted to see if I could do certain things. This is in fact a real PC that's right behind me. And I'll wait for the scene to change so you can see that they're both changing at the same time. This is the first time I've ever done this. I believe my face is turning red because I'm incredibly nervous and anxious. So please try to ignore that. Hopefully my camera's white balance will correct for me. So I see a demo from 1985 or 1984. It's not a real demo because the concept didn't exist. Uh, this is something called artificial art, which draws interesting <laughs> uh, nonsense on the screen and uh, was actually part of a New York uh, art installation from what I understand, which is a little crazy. It's not a true crack -trow demo scene demo, but I was always fascinated by this. I was probably interested in the demo scene before the demo scene existed. I loved this kind of, look at that, this kind of uh, strange, I mean, this thing's creating like abstract op art right now. Eventually it'll clear the screen and, and do something else. But uh, all these, these interesting little graphics demonstrations, trying to figure out weird, unconventional graphics things that you could do um, with your PC. Den said some very nice comments on the shrink wrap video. It was beautifully shot, wasn't it? Oh, when I go into the uh, test your knowledge part, and just the first two shots of the box moving around and the light behind it and stuff. I mean, I'm a total amateur and I looked at that and I was like, oh, no, oh, it's so glamour photos of, of software. I just love it. I have a great story about VHS rips and copyright strikes. At least I think it's a great story. I run a sock puppet account and it, the sock puppet account has its own YouTube channel and that channel has VHS rips and laser disc rips of things that I thought were super cool that needed to be preserved or brought to people's attention. And I did it primarily to get copyright strikes and content ID matches away from my personal channel and from the old school PC channel. And for the longest time, it was disheartening to see that channel explode in subscribers and views and it's all pirated content. And I won't name the channel, because I don't want to get in trouble, but it was very interesting. It's, I started it in 2012, I think, and I used it to probe YouTube's content ID system. I would speed things up, I would slow them down, I would reverse them, I would pitch shift them, leaving the time the same. I would uh, edit them, I would re-edit already edited things. Uh, just probing the algorithms, just probing the system. You can utterly distort audio and still have it picked up by content ID. Um, it's astonishing. So around 2018, it was like not worth it anymore. And so I would only post stuff that would never have um, any uh, large commercial studio entity coming after me or whatever, like indie films and things like that or commercials. Where did the F did I get the original Alley Cat? I don't remember. But I do have it and I'll prove it. Stay right there. This is the benefit of having everything organized and on shelves. I don't know how well this will show up. This is the original Alley Cat. It's incredibly rare. Yes, this is IBM's original packaging for it. I'm holding it close to my face because I have my automatic focus set to face priority. So hopefully it'll be fine. So you open it up and you get a, it, the front is essentially a picture of what the actual contents are, which is the, the Alley Cat disc and a small manual. And that's it. It's just a folio, and mine's actually slightly beat up, which is a little shame. Um, you cannot find this for less than 500 bucks on eBay. I'm, I didn't pay that much for it. I don't remember how much I paid or when and where I got it. Quick story, I knew a hacker in the 90s who was quite adept at avoiding people, uh, avoiding getting caught when he was hacking into Unix systems because he ran all his processes as the nobody UID. Why is that important? Because at the time, the web was just starting to take off in the mid 90s and uh, the web servers at the time ran as the unprivileged service account user, nobody. When someone cracks into a system, you are immediately looking for what root processes don't look right here. and people don't think to check the non-root 
processes, unaware that they may also be exploiting a buffer overrun or whatever it is to gain uh, escalated privileges. And so he was a hacker known as nobody. He ran his processes as nobody, and that uh, helped him out. You know, when, you, when you're on a Unix system and you do ps-ef and you look at the list of, of processes, it's common to see some nobodies in there. That's an actual account on the system. You just don't expect rootkits to be running as nobody. You expect them to be running as root. In the case of Defender of the Crown, the designer, Kellen Beck, fixed a lot of the balance issues that were on the original Amiga version. He fixed them in the Commodore 64 and PC versions. So I would actually argue the PC version is better than the Amiga version because that's a game that's actually fun to play. Actually, my very first system, the first system I remember typing on that had a display and a keyboard was a serial line analyzer that my father brought home. My father has two degrees, one in journalism and one in engineering. And he found great work writing technical manuals for companies. The perfect blend of both of those, of both of those uh, disciplines. And he brought home a serial line analyzer and I couldn't have been more than six years old. And he sat me on his lap and put me in front of it and I could type on the keyboard and the letters I typed showed up on the display. I don't know what kind of a processor it had. I don't even know if it was running a program or if it was just displaying some dumb stuff. That's the first thing I actually remember. Apparently the IBM port of Juno first is the best. That's 100% correct. And Stu is bringing it up because Stu is the wonderful person who purchased it and dumped it for a software curation group to crack and release to the world. If you are playing Juno First, the PC booter version, you can thank Stu. Thank you, Stu. I don't know how much Stu paid for Juno First. Uh, I spent $300 on Night Stalker. So if you play Night Stalker, <laughs> I'm not asking for money, but maybe give me a shout out because that was, that was expensive. But it hadn't been archived. Uh, my good friend Marco, who is Italian and lives in Italy, he calls himself the best DOS gamer in the world. I am certainly not going to dispute that. He's pretty darn good at a lot of DOS games, and he streams them on his channel, Marco Plays DOS Games. He sent me a shirt. He calls me the DOS Emperor of the world. I don't know what that means, but it makes me laugh every time he says it. And he sent me a shirt that says DOS Emperor of the world on it. I suppose that kind of goes back to the demo scene credo. There's this it's one of my favorite demo scene slogans. It is my favorite demo scene slogan, even though it's terrible, which is, uh, and this is by Sanity, if you're not going to do it better, why do it at all? And on the surface, that sounds awesome. And that is definitely a battle cry for demo sceners. But it it's ne has negative connotations as well. It discourages people who might want to try, and then they're like, well, if I'm not sure I, I can do better, then then why bother? That's the flip side of that slogan. So, kind of a shame. They could have done that much better. You don't erase and repaint all the time. Okay, wow. Uh, I don't think I'm controlling it. It is moving by itself and firing by itself. And you know what? That's fine by me. Because... It's doing a way better job than I could. I wonder if it has color composite output. Well, one easy way to tell. Composite CGA is done with patterns as the beam scans horizontally. So if you want to change the color, it's generally a vertically oriented pattern. So what you're looking for are bars of patterns. If you've ever played Earthworm Jim on the Genesis, there's a lot of that and it definitively answers if Earthworm Jim had its graphics created intending for the composite connector, not the S-Video connector. It definitely did, because those patterns blend into more colors and transparent colors. Does anyone else find it funny that even now, when people walk into a computer room or a mainframe room or something, you hear either Macintosh, classic Mac, floppy disk drive seek noises, or ST-225 seek noises. It's silly. There shouldn't be any noise at all. Or if they really want to do a computer room accurately, the noise should be deafening from all of the air conditioning. Um, my day job is a Unix systems engineer. I go into data centers 
and uh, because I have to troubleshoot something with our setup sometimes. Uh, it's loud as hell. That's what they really sound like, but of course you can't portray that in a movie or a TV show because then you wouldn't be able to hear anybody. Starlight says, I've been cursed with the ability to identify hard drives by sound. Uh, that is a blessing, not a curse. Also, I can identify some software by the sound it makes in the floppy drive. I also consider that a blessing, not a curse. Um, for example, if you were to boot any Electronic Arts booter game on the PC, I could immediately tell that that's what you were starting because their copy protection and their bootloader all have the same sound. It sounds something like, I can't believe I'm doing this, it sounds something like chunk, 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 chunk. And then it stops for a while as it spins on track, uh, I think it's 15, and it tries to analyze if the protection is intact, and then it starts up again, chunk, 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 and then it reads the rest of the disk. Uh, in playing Wizardry on the PC, I learned how to avoid getting killed in Wizardry by listening to the floppy drive. If you kick down a door and it immediately draws the uh, room, then you're good. But if you kick down a door and suddenly the drive goes chunk, 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 you know, or something like that, you're like, oh, oh, it's loading monsters. And I would rip the disc out and save myself from dying. Because <laughs> the longer it would load, the more monsters it was loading up. So after the first, like, three seconds, I'd be like, ah, this party's too big, and I'd, like, dive for the floppy drive and rip it out. And that's not something most emulation can give you. CGA Snow. Man, you want CGA Snow? You ain't seen nothing yet. Now check it out. Snow! And that's real snow. Actually, I put a snow routine into the CGA compatibility tester, if you want to see. Because I know what causes CGA snow, I know how to avoid it. I also know how to deliberately cause it. And I put a CGA snow routine into the CGA compatibility tester. So we can run that for a bit. I have tried to see if I could manipulate the nature of the snow, change its color, change the characters. It's not really possible because it requires timing that is outside the granularity of the operation of the CPU. Uh, snow occurs <clears throat> on original CGA cards and some clones because the memory is not dual ported, which means the CPU can access the memory or the card can access the memory, but they cannot access it at the same time. And there's two ways to deal with that. You can either have the video subsystem win and halt the CPU when it accesses the RAM, and that was the solution done on 8-bit computers, like the VIC-20 and the Commodore, I think. There's a time where when both the video chip and the CPU want access to the RAM, the video hardware wins. And that causes a slowdown because the CPU has to halt for one or more bus cycles. But the integrity of the display is maintained. IBM went the other way. When the CPU and the video hardware want to access the same RAM, the CPU wins. So it reads and writes the byte, and what the video hardware gets instead is garbage. So the video hardware is working fine, it's just not getting, it's not reading the actual video RAM byte, it's reading undefined random status bits. Uh, and I've, I can certainly control, as you can see in this test, I can control where the snow appears, but I cannot control the nature of it. However, I share I'm generating a lot of it. Unlike other 3D games on the PC, this one is just about playable. And that's amazing, considering it's a fully 3D game with a level of detail management. You know, objects farther away have less polygons. Automatic environment detail management. You know, if you have a faster system, the crowd and the clouds and the trees will pop in and out. Uh, frame rate permitting. Multiple camera angles. It's such a great game. Anytime I'm restoring a, a system that isn't a 4 megahertz system, I will always put on Interphase or Indy 500 or something and just marvel at how well the 3D is, is programmed. I would love to interview David Kemmer and try to get more information on, on the creation of Indy 500. Coming up with level of detail, I, he he's gave one tiny brief interview with only a few sentences where he said something along the lines of, um, he said he could only draw 30 polygons of frame to maintain decent speed. So he figured out level of detail to maximize those polygons. Like if you're going to draw 30 polygons, what are the best 30 to draw? And it's obviously more in the close stuff when the cars are close to you and it's less when the cars are far away. I don't know how Jeff Crammon did some of the stuff he did. 
World Circuit is a 3D racing game, similar to what you're seeing now, but of course much better and faster, that runs at perfectly adequate, decent speeds on the Atari ST and the Amiga. And then ported it to DOS, it's like also, it's like amazing. Sometimes you can stare at these things and you can see, based on rendering artifacts or rendering choices, how they're made. And uh, in World Circuit, it finally dawned on me that the wheels, one of the cars came close enough to me that I could see the back wheel pixelate as it got bigger. And I was like, the wheels are sprites. I was like, oh my gosh, of course. And then very carefully, you can see that all the cars are made up of sprites. They look like 3D cars, but they're layers of sprites assembled, you know, painter's algorithm assembled towards you, towards the camera. Brilliant. It's it's not only a brilliant concept to save time rendering the cars, but it's also brilliant from a creative way because you can't just get that idea and make it work. Like you've got to work with your artist or if you're the artist, um, you have to construct that idea in a way that it looks good. So it's not only cool technically and it's cool artistically. Absolutely love that. World Circuit, aka Formula One Grand Prix. Thank you. Fantastic game. North Pier had it, and they had Dactyl Nightmare. And I remember looking at, and I remember looking at it, thinking it was really cool, but then also wondering why the frame rate was so bad. Uh, and then I went back a year later trying to play it, and they had replaced all of it with those Robotech, Robotech, like like Mech Warrior. You know what I mean, like Robotech Mech Warrior. You know the, the fighting robots pods, and you sat in them. And each one was running its own Amiga, 4000, very expensive setup, and it rendered textured polygons incredibly slowly. Like it looked great, and then you're, it was nearly unplayable. And all the pods were hooked up to a 286 in a closet that would synchronize the gameplay between all of them. It handled the communication and the, the start of the game and the reporting of the high scores onto the high score table on some CRT somewhere. I forget the name of those. Um, I remember it being a really great concept at the time and I was like amazed at like, oh, there's an Amiga in there. No wonder it looks so great. But you know, you're, you're kind of kidding yourself. I mean, if you actually looked at it, I think the frame rate was even slower than Dactyl Nightmare. This was just some very small little thing done by someone in Canada in 1987. It renders out a wireframe in 3D, saves the bitmaps, and then it plays them all back. And seeing how that worked uh, gave me a new insight into how animation on the PC is done. Because this is slow enough, you can see it drawing. But now that it's saved all the frames, it's just slamming video memory back into video memory to play it back. So this is the day Teenage Jim learned about caching and flicker-free animation and other things. It's funny how, you know, as we age, um, you know, our brains are organs and our organs uh, start to deteriorate as is the natural process of aging. And it gets harder and harder to commit new information to memory as it does with short-term memory. But the long-term memory stays put. So I think that's why nostalgia is a thing that exists because um, the older you get and the more frustrated you get with living your daily life, you still have very vivid memories of your youth, your teenage years, your early 20s. And uh, so, yeah, check that out. This was a fun experiment. It was really nice to get some interesting historical questions and words of encouragement. I want to thank everybody who subscribes to the channel. If you have any suggestions whatsoever for topics you would like me to cover, please feel free to mention them. I am all ears.